Good evening and welcome to Pride Perspectives, where we share conversations with our community. I'm Kate Vengrove, the Director of Engagement at Trinity Pauling in the Alumni Office. And tonight we are delighted to feature a dynamic group of our young alumni who, who are gonna talk a little bit more about their careers. Uh, Slade Mead, who is the Co-Director of College Counseling, is going to moderate along with Emily Tucci, who's in the Science Department. They will be our fearless moderators tonight. And I'll turn it over to them in a minute, but first, just a couple of housekeeping things. We'll be answering questions that came in through the registration tonight. And, um, but if you have other questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll try to get to them. We do try to keep this to about an hour, um, but we'll definitely get back to you. And then for all of the alumni who are on this call, I wanna put a little plug in for our Trinity Pauling Community Alumni app. It's a great way to connect and network with fellow alums. And um, in the course of this webinar, I'll put the link about how you download it in the Q&A for you. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Slade. Great, thank you, Kate. And thank you alums for, for joining us. And hello, Emily. Uh, Emily had her vaccination today. So if she just kills over, we, we understand what's going on, but uh, it, it's great to see everybody here. And uh, what I'd like to do before we sort of get into the individual uh, jobs, the insurance world, the finance world, the military, and so forth. I'd love every alum to just quickly introduce themselves, say what year you were at Trinity Pauling, where you went to college, uh, what you're currently doing, and, and where you're living. And I'll just call you guys as I see you in the gallery. So uh, if we could start with Mr. Christopher Di Maria, Introduce yourself, awesome. please. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Mead. Uh, so Chris Di Maria, class of 2014, uh, went to Gettysburg College, studied political science, um, currently living in Brooklyn, New York, and working for Edgewood Partners Insurance Company, um, obviously in the insurance industry. And I think it's worth a shout out. Uh, the De Maria's, there were four of you who went to Trinity Pauling. So you represented about 20% of the alumni um, <laughs> of the school. So that's great. How about Taylor? Could you introduce yourself, sir? Absolutely. Good evening, everybody. I'm Taylor Mari, uh, class of 2006. I uh, went to Swanee, the University of South, down here in Tennessee, and uh, I work in a small specialty finance group for a regional bank here in Memphis, where I manage a portfolio consisting of about $680 million in outstanding credit facilities or loans and uh, about $2.1 billion in deposits for uh, financial institutions across the United States. Okay, well, thank you, Taylor, and I, I understand you, you got to uh, spend some time with Bill Taylor when he was down in St. George's in Memphis. So you've stayed in touch Absolutely. with the school through many, many years. Jimmy Lee. That's great. From, from Iowa, talk, talk to us. Hi, uh, I'm Jimmy. Um, I graduated 2014, uh, went to UCLA, studied neuroscience, and um, now I'm a first year medical student at Des Moines University College of Medicine. And, and Jimmy, did you join us as an eighth grader? Uh, I actually, I, I applied as an uh, eighth grader, but they pushed me up to ninth grade. Okay, but because I think at one point you were the youngest student in the history of the school <laughs> and you were about two feet tall and you walked around with a camera and took pictures of everyone and everybody and uh, your hair has grown somewhat <laughs> since I last saw you. It's so great to see you, Jimmy. Great to Mr. see you. Mr. Yaman, hello, sir. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Slade. Uh, my name is Nick Yaman. I was class of 2014, matriculated to Santa Clara University in California, where I was a finance major, um, and I'm currently working for an industrial real estate developer in Seattle, Washington, building warehouses and distribution centers. Wow. Well, great, great to see you. Great to see Likewise. you. Uh, that takes me to AJ Beckwith, who uh, you don't know this AJ, but I use you as an example for every young man who comes into my office and asks me about military academies. I tell them about you coming in as a little sophomore saying, I might be interested in a military academy. Help me, what do I do? So introduce yourself, please. Yeah, no, absolutely, Mr. Mead. I appreciate that too. Uh, AJ Beckwith, class of 2014. I went to the Air Force Academy, currently in the Air Force. I've been in for active duty two years now. 
and I'm down at Fort Bliss, Texas. I'm a tactical air control party officer. Well, thank you for your service, and it is so great to see you. Uh, that brings the wild man, Mr. Hatter. How are you, Sir Christopher? Hey, good to see you, Slade, and nice to be here tonight, um, virtually, I should say. Um, so yeah, my name's Chris Hatter, class of 2014. Um, I live in Manhattan, down in Financial District, not far from Mr. Di Maria. Um, I currently work in technology sales. I attended Williams College, where I majored in English uh, and concentrated in leadership studies. Um, the firm I work at now is called CB Insights. Um, we're a startup of about 400 people, um, and it's great. Great to be here. Guys, it's so good to see you, Chris. Been a while. Mr. <laughs> Keegan Flynn, it's been many, many years, my friend. How are you? Long time. Good to see everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, I uh, I graduated in 2010, uh, and then I went to Denison University in Ohio, and then got uh, my MS at Wake Forest in management, and then I've been in Austin, Texas for the past five and a half years. Uh, I work for Oracle. I, uh, I'm an enterprise sales for them. I manage their uh, strategic accounts within the financial uh, industries. I'm happy to be, be back and see some TP faces. Well, Keegan, I, again, I don't know if you remember it, but I remember your college essay very well. You you taught me how to cook a, an Italian dish. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you still cooking? Are you still a I chef? Actually, uh, I just cooked that dish um, not too long ago with a big uh, nail guy that I shot. So it was uh, it worked out well. So you see, I do actually read these college essays. I, I <laughs> <laughs> that takes me to the honorable... Jay Hooper, he reads how them. are you, Sir Jay? He doesn't only read them, he rewrites them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrific. Uh, my name is Jay Hooper. I represent five towns in central Vermont in the state government. I'm one of the 150 seat holders in the House of Representatives. Um, I graduated from Connecticut College in 2016, having graduated from Trinity Pauling in 2012. Um, I'm a Democrat, um, and I, uh, I, I'm, on, I'm in my third term. I serve on the House Education Committee. Well, thank you for your service, and, and it's so great to see you, Hoops. Uh, it's, I'm going to let people know, uh, Jay Hooper once was in Group 5 and then got to Group 1 and is a, a poster child for uh, just doing meteorology rise to, to great things and it's so good to see you and you look terrific and you have to say hi to your mom and dad for me. Great people. And that leads me to Jacques. Mr. Zelnick, how are you? I'm doing pretty well, Mr. Mead. How are you? It's been a long time. It's been a long time and last time I saw you, you had just come up from Louisiana. So tell us what, what you're up to. Yep. So uh, after TP, I ended up down at Tulane in, in New Orleans and, uh, you know, uh, I played football down there for a few years. And after college, I ended up in law school. Uh, now I am a corporate finance and M&A uh, attorney at Strook, Strook and Levan in, in New York City. And as I recall, your senior essay, you wrote about being in an airplane because you're a pilot. Are you still flying? I, I, I am. Yep. Uh, I haven't flown in, in a few months, so I'm not current right now, uh, but I, I am still flying as much as I can. Unfortunately, uh, the law seems to have a way of getting in the way of free time. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I'm going to turn it over to Emily and uh, let's start the, the, the evening. Okay. Thank you, Slade. I have to say my phone's kind of blowing up over here with so many teachers that are on that are like dying because they can't see your faces and interact with you. So please know that probably many of the teachers that you have amazing fond memories of are missing you and really loving to see each of you. So hopefully they'll reach out and, um, and just thank you for taking time out of your schedules and uh, being here with us tonight. So I'm gonna start with Nick Yaman. Um, a question that came through when people registered uh, quite a few times was, uh, does your college degree match the career that you are currently in? That's a great question. I'm not surprised that it is a popular one. Um, 
yes and no. Um, I will say I was a finance major at Santa Clara um, to refresh everybody. Um, and the coursework as a finance major provided a lot of the baseline and industry jargon and knowledge that I needed to secure my first uh, job, which was actually in Atlanta, Georgia, not to be confusing. Um, but it provided me the baseline knowledge uh, to get into the commercial real estate industry, which I'm still in. Do I apply all of my finance knowledge and coursework on a daily basis? Not necessarily, but I apply it pretty regularly and use a lot of other knowledge that I've gathered along the way. So it was a good jumping off point. Uh, it's still applicable, but there's a lot of real life knowledge that I've, that I've learned and, and use in conjunction with that. Thank you so much, Nick. Hey, Christopher Hatter, question for you, sir. You ready? I'm ready. Here it comes. What advice would the great Christopher Hatter give a college student trying to navigate through the career search process? It's a, it's a great question. I've had Thank a, you. I've, I've had about 30 minutes to think about it. <laughs> um, you know, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this. Uh, when navigating the college career search process, I think you know, I, I'm always something that looks at things kind of top down. And I think if you can take a step back when you're starting out and figure out what your core competency, competencies are, excuse me, um, what you're good at and kind of try and narrow it down from there. You know, I was, you know, I was always a communicator and somebody who really liked to relate to people. Um, and I tried to figure out what careers really circle into that. Um, you know, from there, I would be as inquisitive as possible. Uh, leverage the network around you, your, your TP alums, uh, your college alums, um, your friends, even, you know, their parents or, you know, their family members who are in industries that you want to be involved in, um, have conversations, learn as much as you can, start to figure out what the path is. And I think from there, um, you know, try to do things in your spare time that uh, reflect your interest in these areas so that when you are having conversations and you're, you're interviewing for jobs, you can demonstrate, you know, hey, I, I have an active interest in this and I've shown it in these ways. And, you know, I've worked in the community in, in these aspects and I think it highlights these great things about me. And, um, that's all very high level. You know, obviously the process goes a lot deeper as you get into it, but I think I'll, uh, I'll save your, your college career office, uh, let them do their work there for you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jimmy, I know early or uh, Mr. Mead was saying, I remember, I think you, what age were you when you graduated from Trinity Falling? Uh, I was 16, about to turn 17. About to turn 17 to 16. Wow. Remember, so impressive. So some would say that healthcare has started to become more of a business with less compassion. As you pursue your degree in medicine, what do you hope to bring to the field? Um, that's a very good question, serious question. Um, I think the business aspect of healthcare um, is always more of a necessary evil. Um, on the one hand, it introduced many problems like worsening the barriers to access in healthcare, physician burnout, um, and a variety of other problems. But on the other hand, you need that good business to sustain the organization. So um, I guess the question becomes, how do we gear the healthcare business from a profit-driven model towards a more patient-centered model? And what I've noticed um, in many hospitals and healthcare organizations today, the administrators tend to have very little or no healthcare background. Um, they tend to um, impose Kind of unrealistic and even unethical policies that make sense financially, but they put the patient at risk. Um, I guess another example is um, when you're dealing with health insurance adjusters who have no medical training, but they get to dictate what the procedures the patient can undergo, what the insurance pays. Um, so what I wish to bring, I think, um, more doctors, nurses, and other healthcare practitioners should um, receive more business-related training because I think most doctors that you talk to, they chose their career path and were able to stick to it because um, they truly care for the patient and their health. 
and most doctors are compassionate in that sense. Um, so we need, we definitely need to increase their representation in the administrative positions of power. And I think when the leadership is more focused on patient care, then healthcare can uh, and will become more compassionate than it is currently. That's good. Um, hey, Hoops, you're on, buddy. Your question is, is how did your time at Trinity Pauling influence your career and and this is a little bit unfair because I is. know the story I know the story about your your epiphany in star dorm one night and I want you to share that because we have okay. a lot of uh, students on the call right now so three minutes uh I I <laughs> knew this was probably going to be th this question if I answer it fully it takes about 23 minutes. So I'll chop off 20 minutes. And the reason is because indeed, Slade said it, uh, I was uh, a group five uh, rebellious little shit from uh, the world. And I came to, to uh, Trinity Pauling and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a big dog and I'm calling my own shots. And it turned out that was uh, quickly learned that that wasn't the case. And uh, I got into some trouble as a, as a, sophomore I ended up receiving the most improved student award most improved sophomore award on the last day of school my first year at Trinity Pauling and that was the day I realized geez if I set the bar so low as to be on the ground on the hardwood floor I mean I might, might as well pick it up right pick it up and set it as high as I can and it was thanks to Slade Mead and my advisor Maria Reed uh, who helped me realize that, geez, not only do I need to consider not going to college an option, I should actually go to college and try to go to a good one if I can, if I can get my grades in order. And so I worked my way from group five all the way up to group one. And, and I guess it was, you know, the Hoffmans of the campus who said, geez, this guy maybe isn't perfect, but he's certainly a long shot from where he started. And I guess we should give him good, good, good uh, marks. And, you know, I ended up being the number one, uh, number one ranked in, in group one. And um, so to answer the question in one sentence, uh, Trinity Pauling saved me, fundamentally solved my um, case of, uh, of uh, you know, being a recalcitrant teenager. And uh, ultimately, one night in Star Dormitory, uh, when I was a proctor and prefect, um, I decided during uh, study hall that I would Google um, my father, who was the first Democrat elected in the district that I now uh, represent, about 10,000 constituents uh, in central Vermont. I, I said, geez, if in 2012, here we, we've got a political buzz about campus. You know, we've got, we got all these boys who don't have too much for political persuasion or intuition. And here we are talking about President Obama and uh, the prospect of, uh, you know, his reelection. So I said to myself, if everything goes to schedule uh, in four years, I will graduate from the institution that theoretically accepts me and uh, I'll be uh, in a position maybe to, to jump into the political ring myself, but it will only be if uh, the two seat district I would represent in my hometown uh, had an open seat and sure enough, it did. And um, I was, I think I was in, in one of Slade's classes. I was uh, studying Dean Heller. He's a, a Senator, he was a Senator from Nevada uh, the, the project was, I think Beckwith might have even been in my class. Um, it was, a, it was to, to profile a, a politician and to tell Slade in the class how you, the student, would go about having that certain politician reelected and what the issues that they should. So it kind of got me in the, in the, in the headspace. And uh, I, I said, geez, um, I'm gonna run for office if there's an open seat when I get out of college. And sure enough, it happened to just fall right onto my lap. 
Um, my father got a phone call in January of 2016, which was uh, when we were away from school on break. And it wasn't even, I didn't even have to know the details of the conversation. I was in the room when he received it. Uh, and I figured out uh, the nature of the, the chat. And I said, Dad, you know, I've, I, I've been thinking about this. You, little do you know, but I've actually had this in my mind for quite a long time. And I didn't tell anybody because why would I, uh, you know, if I'm going to take that seriously, it better be something I, sh it better be a, a walk that I walk as opposed to talk. So, um, you know, I, I, I threw my hat in the ring about 10 days after graduating from Connecticut College in March of 2016. And I decided, all right, well, I guess I'll take everything my father taught me as a politician. He did four terms in, in the house, which is eight years. Uh, and then he went on to be secretary of state for only one term because he was too progressive for the town clerks. They threw him out. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyway, the point is, uh, that I decided, geez, I'm going to take where he left off and, uh, and, and do the job even better than he did. That's a great, and to encapsulate what you just said, the whole journey started at Star Dorm. That's right, yes. During, <laughs> during study hall, I was that like... That is pretty cool. Whew, I love big it. things can happen out of Star Dorm. Congrats. It's wonderful. Well, Taylor, you're up next. I feel like I would be remiss to not talk about your amazing voice. I still remember <laughs> you on stage and just the presence that you brought. And uh, I think it was maybe Little Shop of Horrors. I remember that. Yeah. One of That's them right. that you were in. But um, I don't know if you're singing much anymore. Maybe to your little girl, but... Yeah, um, just in the shower nowadays. Okay. Well, you have a beautiful <laughs> voice, I remember. So your question you is, so how much. did you find and get into the work that you are doing now? And I have to tell you, I think it was Mrs. Dealey told me a little bit about your story. So I'm hoping that you will share that with, um, you know, the kids that are on here just as uh, a lesson in working hard. Sure, absolutely. I think it's... Um, the world of finance is, you know, it's not as clear cut and dry as going to law school and getting a job kind of deal, especially when I came into the workforce um, in 2010, we were in the midst of a, a you know, the financial crisis and uh, job opportunities were very few and far between. Uh, but in college and, 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 and at TP, I knew that I was always going to be in the banking and finance world. Um, and when I got out of school, um, I just, I worked at a restaurant, you know, until I, uh, um, sent my resume to all the banks in town. Um, uh, like Chris said earlier, I think that was one of the most important things that I kind of hark on when you're climbing up is to, uh, leverage the relationships around you is one of the most important things that I think that you can do. So, you know, you see some guys that you've got interest in and say, hey, I want to I want to do what that guy does one day, call them and ask them to lunch. You know, these guys are always incredibly um, helpful for the younger generation um, because they know that, you know, it's going to take um, our age kind of group to, uh, to to continue their company forward as well. But um, so I ended up getting a job uh, in the mail room of a small community bank here. Um, sorting mail and um, organizing supplies for all the branches around the Memphis area. Um, and uh, I guess it was technically in the operations division. Um, but, you know, it's just uh, going back to what I said, it's just getting your foot in the door any possible way that you can, because once you're in the doors um, and around uh, the culture uh, of the organization that you're in, it becomes much more easier to um, talk to people in the organization about how they got there and what I need to do and X, Y, and Z. Um, and it allows you also to, to shine. Um, and, um, you know, after, uh, I guess three years of doing that, um, they, uh, um, I moved up to an investment bank. Um, I was lucky at my first, my first bank that I was at, it was just a community, uh, uh commercial and residential lending bank. And, uh, 
you know, I uh, was able to kind of build my resume. They, they give you more jobs uh, as you kind of progress um, through there. So, um, again, it's just a resume builder at that point, knowing you want to get to point B next. And at the investment bank, that's where I was able to get my Series 7, 66, and all kinds of other licenses that you need to in order to get an investment community. Um, but even so, I knew that that wasn't my end game, really, because like, from a little from a little kid, I wanted to work at First Horizon. It was First Tennessee at the time. They just changed their name. Um, so when I was at the investment bank, going back to what I was saying earlier, um, you leverage the people around you um, as, as, as any way that you can. So I would call some of the, the um, um, corporate leaders, some of the executives, just to take them out to lunch and, and pick their brains and say, what do I need to do to get here? And, well, Taylor, you need a little bit more experience in this area, or you need to, uh, um, you know, this kind of licensing will, will help you out, um, and just get to know people and network, and 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 we'll we'll come back to you in a little bit. And so, after the investment bank, I, I wanted to expand my experience more and went back to the community banking world, um, but this time as a commercial and residential lender, and just again at a local bank here in town, but. Again, the whole time taking taking these guys, the same guys, usually for about you know five or eight years, it seemed to go, um, just waiting on the sidelines. And what it essentially boils down to is you're earning your stripes and your reputation, and you're earning your work ethic and um, and your skills uh, in the corporate world. And these guys, um, you know, if you knock on the door long enough. Um, will be receptive. And so uh, about three or four years ago, um, one of the executives that I had been hounding for, like I said, about seven or eight years at the time, um, was gracious enough to call me and say, hey, Taylor, I think you've earned your stripes here. And um, we've got a position that would be great for you. Um, now that we know all about you, you know, we don't even really need, you know, we, we think that you'd be perfect for this position. So, um I jumped at it and, um, um, you know, it's been just a, a delight and a great, uh, a great end to my company here as well. And, um, so to answer the question again, in one sentence, I think you need to leverage all the relationships around you as best that you can, uh, and work hard. So. Before I ask Chris, your question, Taylor, I don't know if you even remember, you just said, I was lucky, and, and, and I don't know you, but I, I would respectfully disagree. It's not mm -hmm. luck, you made your own luck. Mm -hmm. you were, sure. Your perseverance paid off. Mm -hmm. And perseverance oftentimes can be confused for luck, but it's not luck, you made your own luck, mm -hmm. you, you earned it. Sure. There's Which some kind a of a very quote out there. important point that I can't, that I can't do it justice. I'm, I'm sure Mr. Hoffman could probably help me out with this, but it's along the lines of, you know, uh, I find that the harder I work, the luckier I become kind of thing, you know? Yep. So yep. I agree with you there. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I have a question for the great Christopher D. Maria. Uh, and for those of you that have never met Chris D. Maria, let me just tell you, he could sell ice cubes to Eskimos. I mean, this guy can talk his way through or in or around or out of trouble or you say it, he can do it. So Christopher, I may ask you a question about interviewing because that involves talking. How did you prepare for interviews and do you have any Christopher D. Maria tricks that you like to pull off when you interview? Uh, absolutely. I would say just to preface, just to preface too, there's no secret recipe for interviewing. It's all really going to depend on, you know, who you are and your study habits and um, you know, the industry you're interviewing for. But for myself, um, it was just preparation. I printed out or I actually got the um, the job listing and the roles and responsibilities, turned that into a Word document. And for every bullet point that there was within that um, roles and responsibilities, kind of turning that into a relationship between your experience and your past experience. Um, so that was something that I did a lot of then turning that, all those bullet points into almost a little story and then reciting that story in front of the mirror, which is what I did for about five hours before my first interview at a college, um, really helped me just kind of hammering home and almost memorize, memorizing those answers because you know those questions are coming. Um, I think one resource that I didn't really learn about until after my interview was 
Um, you know, there's a ton of technology and websites out there that can give you some insight into the jobs that you're looking at applying to. One of them would be Glassdoor. I would definitely encourage um, some of the younger alumni to make an account on Glassdoor. You can look at almost any job listing or any job um, that's out there. And they are, they actually, what they do is they get people who have those job titles and they're, they're able to anonymously submit um, questions that had been asked to them in the interview. And so you're able to kind of go in and see what questions are typically asked of someone within that position. That was something that I didn't learn about until after my interview, but um, I've actually just finished up another um, interview for a new job a few weeks ago. And that's something that I leveraged pretty heavily. And it actually helped me a lot, um, even beyond um, the interview questions, it gives you insight into salary as well. So it's just, you know, all in all, I would say definitely leverage the technology that's available to you. Um, you can, you know, learn a lot more than just a, a job listing online. You can actually figure out what, what questions are typically, um, you know, asked to a candidate. The number one recommendation I would say is just literally stand in front of a mirror and not read off paper and just go off the top of your head. I think that's something that probably helped me the best. Christopher, you possess one of the wittiest, funnest senses of humor of a Trinity Pauline student that I, I've ever known. I don't know about do you that. bring that sense of humor into the interview or do you try to keep it serious? Serious. Uh, I, I don't think I'm funny enough to be throwing jokes in the middle of an interview as much as Jay would uh, want me to. But no, I, I try and keep it as, uh, as serious as possible. Okay. I have Good a quick advice. question too for Chris, only because I follow you on social media and I see that you're a bit of an entrepreneur as well, which I don't see that maybe as like a, something on here. So can you talk a little bit about um, maybe how you kind of put yourself out there with your idea and, and maybe for those people that are listening that are interested in, think they have a great idea, um, or product and how, what advice you would give them? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just keep it short and sweet because I know we're trying to keep it under an hour here. But um, in March, obviously the pandemic hit. I was living in a one bedroom apartment on the Upper East Side. Um, There's no laundry service in my building. So I used a service that would come pick up my laundry. Everything was shut down. So that also shut down. I had no way to get my laundry clean, especially. Um, my boxers. So I was looking online to figure out a way for me to kind of get a, a, a boxer subscription. Um, there weren't any, I was looking for, you know, some particularly that are made in the United States, uh, more so made in New York City. Um, and there were none at all. So I went down to a fabric shop and started doing some research on some factories within New York City. Um, and it kind of just launched from there. I did my research for about two, three months before I initially started asking people for some seed money. Um, and then, you know, it kind of just took off from there. But before I even launched the business, it was about seven months of just crunching numbers and, and doing, um, doing some backend research. But the whole business proposition is boxers that are made in New York City by small businesses. And for every 25 pairs um, that we sell, we donate um, a pair to a men's homeless shelter in New York City called the Bowery Mission. So hopefully as we begin to scale, we can um, you know, give more back to the community because you know, one in 25 is pretty small, but hopefully um, we, can, you know, we can scale that number as we grow. I love it. Thanks so much for just talking about that quickly. Absolutely. Chris. Uh, next we have Jacques. I know it's been a little while. I know you had come back the last time I saw you, you were in the advancement office making some phone calls and giving back and everything, but that was quite a few years ago now. So um, what is something that you learned when you first started out in your job that you think would be important to know and share with uh, the students on this call and other young alums? You know, the, the, the biggest thing that I've been able to learn in, in my first three years in the industry is, you know, and it's something that we've had that I think a lot of folks share at TP that come out of TP is, you know, we're inherently difficult on ourselves and hard on ourselves when we make a mistake and drop the ball on something. And you have to understand that, especially when you're starting out at your first 
real professional job after school, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have to adjust to a very steep learning curve. And the, the biggest piece of advice that I can give in that respect is to focus on the learning aspect of that mistake rather than giving yourself a hard time for making a mistake. You know, it's, you, you, you're not going to be perfect and you have to understand that there are things that you just don't know, especially when you're involved in a very complex industry. Um, and it's just very important, one, for your own mental set, sanity, but also for your future success to build on those mistakes and, and relish in them rather than giving yourself a hard time for them. That's pretty good. <laughs> I'm glad you did it again. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, anytime. Uh, I'm going to shift gears and go from law to military. Uh, AJ, well, first, it's so great to see you. You look terrific. You actually look the same age as when you graduated, which makes me feel good. Uh, <laughs> did, did you take any classes at Trinity Pauling, uh, AJ, that lit a fire or helped you to inform your decision to go to a military academy? And I do have a follow-up question about the military academy because somebody's asked it in the Q and A. But go ahead. Okay, absolutely. Uh, off the bat, no, there wasn't any particularly any particular class that led me towards wanting to go to a service academy. The biggest factor for me was there were two dudes, uh, Chris Murphy, who's uh, who graduated a year before me, and then Mitch Botini, who's a good buddy of Jay's. Uh, they were interested in the uh, academies, and I played hockey at TP. Uh, the ultimate goal was to play Division One, and I figured kids my age weren't exactly chomping at the bit to go to a service academy to play hockey. I figured they'd want to go to, like, ASU or uh, try and get a little different experience out of their uh, out of their yeah college experience, probably a little more fun one. But uh, I kind of started digging deep and uh, talking to the, those guys more and bouncing around the different service academies in the area. And ultimately, the Air Force Academy was definitely the one for me. Good. The, the part about the whole academy is I remember telling you, I believe it was your sophomore year, that you should make an effort to reach out and get to know your congressperson uh, so that you could get a letter of recommendation, a congressional nomination. And I think you took it to quite the nth degree with Congresswoman DeRosa. Have I created something, a myth in my mind, or is it true that you ended up basically working for the Congresswoman? Uh, no, that was pretty much it. Uh, I mean, you brought up the suggestion like, hey, you need a, for anyone who doesn't know, you need a nomination from your congressperson or senator in order to go to a service academy. So. Mr. Mead brought up the idea of, hey, if you need something from them, why don't you provide something to them? And I wound up working for Congressman DeLauro for uh, two summers in a row. And yeah, she wound up giving me the uh, a nomination to the Academy. So it all worked out for sure. Uh, it was long days. And honestly, I don't care much for politics. But I mean, doing, doing the things you don't want to do uh, definitely paid off in the long run and I, that would be my biggest advice or be my biggest piece of advice to anyone who's um trying to attain any goal that they've set for themselves it's it's usually digging deep and doing the things most people don't want to do well thank you and, and um when you went to trinity pauling a lot of the students feel that this is a very rigid school that there's a lot of rules and the effort system and you've got to be where you have to be somewhere all the time. Did it prepare you well for the Air Force Academy or are we just kidding ourselves? This is a country club compared to a military academy. No, I definitely appreciated the structure at TP. It helped me uh, get uh, much more focused in terms of goals and especially classes. Cause I mean, it was, uh, they were looking for a very specific thing out of kids that were applying to the academies and I had to take a lot of AP courses and honors courses and I mean it was tough but having that structure and especially the effort system if you get rewarded for the work you're putting in I definitely I think it helps students and young uh, young men feel like their effort that's being put in is being directly rewarded whether um, 
whether the effort system provides anything tangible or not, having that, hey, like we recognize that you're putting in the work, you're doing well, like a pat on the back definitely goes a long way. So I would say the, the structure of training phone definitely prepared me for um, my four years at the Air Force Academy. Thank you. And thank you for your service. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, Keegan, that leaves you. <laughs> I know. Last but certainly not least, I know when uh, Mr. Mead and I and uh, Ms. Vengrove met today and we were trying to, you know, just talk about each of you and your time here and we were reminiscing and it was really lovely. And I know Mr. Mead touched upon the story, but it was his first year um, that when you graduated and he said, wow, that college essay still stands out to me as just absolutely amazing. So that says something, because Mr. Mead, how long have you been here now? 13. 13, 13 years. 13. Look at that, Keegan. Oh. Damn. Pretty impressive. <laughs> Okay, well, I remember, I, remember, <laughs> I remember a lot of the essays, like I think Di Maria's was in Cram. That was pretty cool. I thought that was a good touch. <laughs> I, I was Chris's uh, senior proctor when he was a freshman, so that's a bit of an upgrade if he got that part of the Cram. I, I was a good proc D, right, Keegan? Huh? I was, I was a good proc D, right, Keegan? Yeah, you were such a joy. <laughs> oh, my. Well, my question for you. Um, is did you have any sort of a sense of what you wanted to do when you were in high school or did that come about in college for you or was it after you graduated college? Um, no, I had an idea that I wanted to work with people similar to what uh, Chris said um, earlier that sort of I knew, I knew my skill set was communication, uh, not so much technical. Uh, my dad was in finance. He's very much of a numbers guy. Um, and I knew that wasn't quite my path. Uh, and then as I got into college and then later grad school, I kind of, kind of realized that sales would be a little bit more of a, be able to key into what I was actually interested in. So I chose to go large company first, um, Oracle, uh, one of the largest and get a good foundation. But I thought that sales and being within, uh, technology specifically, which I thought had a lot of open doors, I could then. Uh, hone myself down later on and find something that I actually truly cared about. Not that HR software is not my true passion, but um, just being able to to get into a sales role, get into more of a communication-based industry, and then be able to direct myself towards something that was a little bit more interesting towards my interests and uh, hopefully mix the free time with the professional time. So I'm just at that inflection point now, hopefully get out of Oracle soon and uh, start going smaller and do something that really sort of spikes the interest. Well, it's interesting listening to you all. There, there's been sort of a common thread and that's, you know, networking, meeting people. I think Taylor did a great job talking, you know, your story was fantastic. And I'd never heard that before about starting at the mailroom and working your way up and just perseverance. And one of the things I want to share with you guys um, of, that's different about Trinity Pauling than when you were here is we have put in place something called the practicum. And, and I, I want to invite not just the alums on this panel, but any alums who are listening, uh, the, the, the importance of networking. Uh, we now have an avenue where if you want to give back to the school with networking, we, we, we have a way to do it because all our seniors are doing a senior independent project now. And um, if, they, if their project lends itself to working with an alum for a mentor-mentee relationship, uh, it, it's invaluable. So I'm reaching out to all you guys, if you're interested in being a mentor to a Trinity Pauling senior for next year, it happens in the fall, you know, please, please let us know, let Kate know, and we will try to link you in with a student. Uh, and I, I think, you know, listening to you here tonight, I know the, the guys on this panel understand the importance of this, having a mentor. Yeah. And uh, so I'm inviting you to be a mentor for, for the practicum, for the yeah. senior independent projects. Uh, so I think just that, to that would be- on that correctly, for yes. all the panelists out there and everyone else who's listening, 
uh, I mean, everything, I think everyone knows this, but everyone likes to talk about themselves and you don't know what you don't know, quite frankly. And if you just put the time into networking and just talk to people and allow them to talk about themselves and what their experiences are, they're going to say something that strikes your interest, something that you had no idea existed. And if you just put the time in and listening to other people's stories, you're going to hear something uh, that you didn't know existed and that you can then capitalize on. So I think that's the most important thing to remember is you don't know what you don't know. And you just got to have open ears and ask people about themselves and you'll find an answer. Make so your I, own might say, I might say you, you're, you're open to talking to a senior. Yeah, feel free to call me. Yeah. I, don't need, I, don't need, I don't need a calendar yeah, invite. Just... Okay. <laughs> and I would add on to that too. I mean, definitely the practicum is, is a great opportunity to, to connect the seniors and, the, and our alumni, but also the, connecting the alumni with each other too, because I know a lot of our, our college students um, would definitely, you know, love to have um, have your ear and hear more what you're doing. Um, so, so, and uh, the app again that I put the um, the information in the chat there is a really great way to to connect in. So, I want to say I don't know if you guys can see the different people that are on the call, but those of you that are here, if you want to look kind of through and see if any of those kids were in your class or your teachers, or if you think you have anything else maybe that you want to share since we have a couple minutes. Um, I think if you go to participants, you can see some of your former teachers and maybe some classmates there, if you care to see um, or say anything to them. Shout out to Matt Mancuso. My <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hoffman, Matt Mr. Metcalf. How, how often do you guys talk to fellow TP alums? Is it I'm weekly, a Dale? Slide I, I know, Jay, you send us the solicitation letters every two years, but other than that. <laughs> did, did I tell you the story about when I met Pat Leary? I met oh, him. No. At, I met him at Connecticut College. Pat, Pat Leary was a was was a student. He was, he was one of these like there were probably four or five dudes who I knew a lot about but I never met. It, it, like when I got to Trinity Pauling, because there were a lot of stories about them, they had just left, or, you know, and he was one of them. And uh, he had gone to. Um, uh, He's he a Hofstra, had, wasn't he? Yeah, Hofstra. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And then he transferred to Connecticut College. And I remember just like, you know, at college, after the cafeteria clears out during lunch, there's like a two o'clock period where there aren't very many people, but they're still serving lunch. It was one, it was during that time. And I sat down, I said, you mind if I sit with you? It was like at the tables where the hockey players and the lacrosse players sat. And somehow that was where I sat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he was sitting there and he had, we ended up striking up a conversation and it turned out like he had heard of me and I'd heard of him and we were like oh, well that's you know really fun but I just texted him I asked him if he knew uh Taylor Morey but um Taylor's a couple years before him apparently and uh, I an old geezer <laughs> <laughs> well, well it's, it, it is interesting the networking and and I've had it happen quite a few times where I'll wear my Trinity Pauling baseball hat given to me by one of the teams. And I've been in airports and stuff and people will stop you. And next thing you know, it's like, oh, so-and-so. And, you know, the business relationships that can come out of innocent things like just wearing a hat, uh, the networking is tremendous. And, and you know, I, I encourage you guys when you're out and about, you know, if you wear a Trinity Pauline, you know, shirt or a hat, you'll be surprised. And, and those are when opportunities, you know, it's almost like when you least expect an opportunity to come along, it comes along. Uh, and it goes a little bit to Taylor's thing is you can make your luck by, uh, you know, pushing the system a little bit. Absolutely. Kate, you had, there were some questions that came in this afternoon. I don't have that list in front of me. Do you, well, there's one that just came in right now from Matt Mancuso as well. It, I don't know if 
who wants to answer this? I know lots of his buddies are on here, but it says as young professionals, what is the hardest obstacle to overcome when transitioning from the educational practice into the professional practice? Oh, this is for you, Christopher. It's putting you on the spot. Which Chris? Oh, Chris De Maria, it says, sorry. You, you Christopher, not Chris. That, is that for me? Sorry, I broke off for a second. <laughs> That was, I don't know if you heard what I said, but I didn't. no, I didn't Sorry. question from, Oh, Ann Hatter up. Oh, <laughs> you're not, you're not off the hook. So it says as young professionals, what is the hardest obstacle to overcome when transitioning from the educational practice into the professional practice? Um, I mean, I'll start Chris, but I would say just for me, it's, um, not having, uh, someone that's constantly checking in on you, someone that's making sure you're waking up, you know, doing your work and you're, and you're meeting deadlines. I would say you just have to kind of be self-disciplined. That was something that, um, you know, took a little bit for me to kind of get used to and not having someone constantly hounding you to do things. You kind of got to be your own, your own boss. And, you know, one thing that kind of really helped me with that was um, organization. I know obviously at, at TP, we all have our, our planners and we try and stay, um, as organized as possible, but that's something that I definitely carried over into, um, you know, my work, just staying on top of everything and writing everything down. And um, you don't lose the planner. It, it may change in size or shape or color, but uh, you definitely still use a planner. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but uh, that definitely has helped me transition into the, the corporate world. And uh, thank you, Matt. Yeah, and I, I mean, just within that same vein, I guess I'll, I'll give my version. Um, I think from like a more meta sort of way, like the, the idea of linearity in life, you know, I think from like a young age, you know, it's really clear what you have to do, like going from like, you know, pre-K, first grade, second grade, you know, you go to that really good high school, like a Trinity Pauling, you move, you go to college, there's all these sort of accolades you can kind of work your way up to. And when you come out into the professional world, um, things sort of open up and that that structure in life, that kind of like, that one step, two step progression that you've been kind of raised on for 22 years um, kind of goes out the window and, and it's really your, your path to choose things. So um, I think that's, I don't know if it's necessarily an obstacle or an opportunity, I guess it's the way you want to see it, but um, it's definitely a change of, of pace and tempo for you when you're making that, that switch over. Is that true for you too, AJ, or did the military kind of tell you what to do? How much, how much latitude were you able to, or latitude may be the wrong word, but how much tr input did you have into what part of the Air Force you wanted to go into upon graduation? So you can, when you're a senior, you can apply for different jobs. You can kind of rack and stack what you want. Um, I was fortunate enough that my job was one you had to try out for. Uh, I went to like a week long interview, um, if you want to call it that. And um, you, they're pretty good about giving you what you want as long as your grades are squared away. But again, the better you do, the more likely you'll get the job that you want. Uh, that's okay. coming the Air Force Academy and I'm, I'm sure it would be the same at West Point, but uh, Navy might be a little different, I'm not sure. And I do have a rising senior who really wants to go to the Air Force Academy. And with your permission, I'd like to put him in touch with you. Oh, absolutely, for sure. Good. Thank you. No problem. Uh, there's another question here. What is some advice you can give somebody who's interested in sales um, and talking a little bit about sales and real estate also? Um, you know, is sales similar to real estate? You can sales, about listening. sales is about listening, not talking. It's just the primary rule. Just listen to what people have to say and try and fill a need. Um, if you try and talk over people or uh, tell them everything you want to, you want to tell them as fast as you can, you'll never make a sale. Um, I think the biggest advice I got was just be quiet. Silence is your friend. Chris, what do you have to say? I, I completely agree with you. I think <laughs> once you stop uh, over talking and over communicating and, you know, letting that commission breath kind of come off, uh, you'll, you'll probably get a lot better at your job and, you know, start trying yep. to meet people's needs and meet them on their level rather than trying to yeah. push something up against them all the time. Nick, mm -hmm. is that the same for real estate? 
I don't specifically work in, in real estate sales per se, um, but one kind of theme with, you know, whether you're selling an apartment building or trying to lease an office space is those broker roles as they're, as they're called in the real estate industry are, are typically all commission based. So your income is directly related to, um, you know, the properties that you sell or the office space that you lease. So my, I guess my comment on sales in the real estate realm would be, you know, you have to know what you're getting into um, and you have to know that it's going to take a lot of work um, because it's an eat what you kill type of of situation. So, um, you know, a lot of people are very successful in that space, um, but it it takes a certain amount of tenacity to, to, to be successful in that space. So that would be my one comment as it relates to the real estate industry. Well, since we have one minute left, can I ask a favor of these guys, Kate? Since you're our hostess, um, <laughs> I'm assuming, and, and Jimmy Lee, you're probably the best position to confirm or deny that this pandemic will have an end. And when it does, I really, really hope that we get to see you guys here on campus. Um, I'm getting a lot of chit chat from teachers and, and alums just saying, how great it is to see your faces. And we feel very far away because of the pandemic, but I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And, and, and when we're allowed to come back together, man, I would love to see each and every one of you. And I'd love to meet you, Taylor, bring your guitar with you uh, and your legendary Clearly. voice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll get back on stage, dust off the old pipes. <laughs> Beautiful. But it, it is, it's, it's more than a privilege to be with you guys. It's just, it's so fun. And I just feel so excited. And I feel so friggin' old when I see the years you graduated. Um, yeah, look, Emily's now crying over it. But I'm so proud of so many of you for just great things you're doing, serving your country. Uh, living your dreams, uh, making your your fantastic two-day Italian dish that still is etched in my mind from your college essay. Uh, going to law school, Jacques, I know that you, you really wrestled with that whole issue after Tulane and you did it and, and you've done well. And Jay, man, I, I want to visit you in the governor's mansion someday. And Jimmy, if I'm ever sick, I'm coming to Iowa, buddy. Uh, you, you guys are, are superstars. You really are. And, and I, I, would, I would love this. I'm getting all emotional. I'd love to see you guys come back and visit when this pandemic's over. So God bless you guys and thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mead. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you thank guys. You. This was great. fantastic. Thanks. Such great advice shared tonight. And everyone, as you see, um, many of them put their emails in um, in the chat. So feel free to reach out to them. And um, and thank you to all of the panelists and to Slade and Emily. And thank you all for tuning in tonight. Um, have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.